Hello! Welcome to the x 280 tutorial about Git. My name is Rachel Mayhe and today we're going to be talking about the structure of Git and how to use Git in a useful way. Some things to note is that this tutorial is actually based on other tutorials, one by Professor Diorio and one by Frederico Mena Quintero. Those two tutorials can be found at these two sites and are useful if you are still confused later on. So, getting started with this tutorial, let's talk about setting up Git repos and the actual structure of Git. So what exactly is a Git repo? Well, there are two types of repos. Uh, there's a local repo and a remote repo. And repo just stands for a repository. A repo is basically a virtual folder. It is a folder where you're keeping your code for a project. It usually contains some type of text uh, readme file, which basically describes what the project actually holds. So let's get a little bit more into the structure of Git. So on your personal device, you have these three areas. The first is the workspace. This is the area where you're actually writing and debugging code. So this is Vim, Visual Studio, Xcode, and other ed IDEs and editors. You then have the staging area. The staging area is where you put files that you've made changes to or new files that you want to add to your project. It basically is the place where files get ready to be committed to that local repo. And then you have the actual local repository. Now remember this local repo is just that virtual folder which contains the project and the code that is going to be pushed to the remote repository. This folder basically holds your version of the project, so it's your most updated version with your changes. So you want to make sure you're keeping that the way you want it to look. You also have this remote repository. So this black line on this diagram actually signifies um, a change from your local device to a remote server. So it's just some place somewhere else where the code is being kept. It's important to note this because let's say something happens to your laptop and your code and everything that's on it, um, you still have this remote repository because it's on some server somewhere else. So your code is still able to be accessed, which is super helpful. Um, it also allows other users to access the project. So not everyone can get to your specific device, but everyone can get to some remote server. And this allows everyone to update the code and to be able to get the most updated version of code. So to put the up most updated version of code, they can do a git push, and to get the most updated version of code, they can do a git pull or a git clone. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those actually mean in a bit. So how do we create this local repo or virtual folder on our device? Well, you first go to the directory where you actually want to put this uh, repo. And just as a note, I'll be putting um, helpful commands in these purple boxes, which basically, for this one, we're going to want to use the git init command. So let's actually do that. So here I have my terminal. Um, I'm running in Ubuntu because I'm on a Windows device. For other people, you may be running just in terminal on Linux or for an Apple device. I also have a folder that I've created. It's in x280 in the desktop, and you can see my terminal is also in that same place. So let's actually Let's actually make a new folder and we'll call it test git. So we've made a folder called test git and as you can see that folder was created in my folder there. And now let's actually go there. So change directory test git. So now that we're in that folder, we're going to want to create our local repo. So let's run that command. So git init. And here we have it. Um, git is telling me it initialized an empty git repo in this folder. So let's check. And as you can see, there is now a .git folder. So yay, that actually worked. So what then are we going to want to do? Well, now that we've created a local repo, we're going to want to create a remote repo. So the University of Michigan provides all of its students, or the engineering students rather, with a GitLab pro profile. This is very similar to GitHub, so if you're familiar with that or you want to be familiar with these, uh, instructions are very, very similar. So let's go there. We'll go to GitLab. Here is my profile on GitLab. As you can see, I've been working on a few other things, but let's create a new project. 
It's a new project. And we're going to call it uh, test kit, which is just the same name that I created for this folder. And we'll say it's a project to learn about Git. And we'll mark it as private so that we don't violate any honor code um, violations or don't get any honor code violations for any of our projects because no other people can view it. So let's create project. Boom, it's been successfully created. All right. So now that we have this remote repo, we actually want to make sure it's configured properly to our username. So basically what that means is since we're, I'm rather the user RL Mangy, I'm just going to run this and it will tell it that RL Mangy is the one who is putting these commits on. So we only need to do that once for a Git folder. So now that we have that done, we're good to go. And as you can see here, GitLab also provides helpful commands for things that you want to do. We already have an existing folder, so we're going to be looking at these commands. And since we're already in it, we don't need to go there. We've already initialized, so we don't need to do that. And we're at this step. We want to actually add an origin to this GitLab. So here, I'm going to put the command. So as you can see, it says git remote add origin HTTPS and then this long username. So the remote add origin just tells you where that repo is and how we can connect to it. So if you go back here, we already have these two local and remote repositories. But how do we actually connect them? Well, that's where this HTTPS comes into play. We connect them by basically using the URL that GitLab provides us. You can also use SSHing, which is the secure shell. And this is just a little diagram about how that works. But for now, let's just work with HTTPS. So if we go back and we look at our GitLab, we can see that this is just the URL that they provided here. So you can copy it or just use the command they gave you. We'll just run with the command they gave us. And there you go. We now have connected our local and remote repositories. All right, well now that we have them, let's actually add some files to make this a little more interesting. So let's go to our folder and we'll create a new text document and we'll call it tester. And in tester, we'll add a phrase, hello world, oops, come on now. Hello world of Git. All right, so now we have this tester doc, and it is not on our remote repository yet. As you can see, this project is empty. I'll refresh it for you non-believers, but it is in fact empty. So let's look here. How then can we add stuff? Well, if we go back to here, we can actually make a git add and start the change from our workspace to our remote repository. So some things to keep in your back pocket are the git status and git log commands. The git status command basically tells you what's in your staging area and what's in your workspace area. So git status will tell you what things have been changed and need to be added, so need to go through this add command, and what things are in the staging command and need to be committed. So we'll show you what that looks like in a second. You also have this git log command. It'll tell you things that have been committed and tells you essentially what's in your local repo and the commit messages along with it. So let's first do that git status command. So git status. As you can see, we have some things that need to be added. It's in red here. So let's add that. We'll do git add dot. The add dot command just adds everything that needs to be added. So here, just tester. And we'll do a git status. As you can see, it is now in green and is ready to be committed. So now we've officially done the git add. We're from workspace into staging. And now we just need to do a git commit to go to our local repo. So let's do that. Let's do git commit. We'll do the m flag commit, which essentially just means add a message. All right. We've done a commit, we've messaged it initial commit, and it's added one file. 
Sweet. So let's check to make sure that actually worked. Git log. All right, we have a commit that's been created and it was by RL Mengi, yours truly. And um, yeah, so now let's actually push that to our remote repository. So just to show you again where we're at, we've done this git commit, we're in our local repo and we're ready to do a git push to that remote repository. So it still isn't here. I'll refresh to show you, still isn't here. All right, so let's do that git push. Git push and there's also a few other things we're gonna do we're gonna do dash u origin master which basically just indicates we're putting it on the master branch Oops. Origin master. and we'll get a little bit more into what the master branch means later but for now just sign in some things to keep in mind are I am typing my password and it is recognizing it it just doesn't show it up, so don't be afraid if nothing's actually being typed for your password. And there you go. We have something telling us that it has now officially been pushed. We can double check this. And look at there you go. We now have a document called Tester, and it says, Hello World of Git. Well, that's super useful because now we have made changes from our local repo to a remote repository. But what if we want to do it the other way around and take from our remote and put it onto our local. So let's say someone made a change on here for us. Um, we'll just do it in the actual web development, but you can imagine this is someone else making a change and uploading it to here. So let's just say they think, oops, this should be an extremely happy face. So we'll just put a save there and commit those changes. And look, now we have an extreme happy face. Well, we're now gonna do a git pull of those changes. So let's look and do that. So first, let's double check our tester. It still has a smiley face. When we do this git pull, let's see what happens. Oops, we have too many spaces, git pull. And it's gonna ask for my username and password again. It'll do it. And as you can see, tester has been changed. There's been one insertion and one deletion. And let's look and see here. And would you look at that? It has in fact been changed to an extreme smiley face. So there you go. That is exactly how git pull and pushes work. So if we go back to here, you can see we've done our git push and now we've done a git pull as well and our workspace in, as such has been updated. So that's the first part of this tutorial about the structure of git. These other commands you can kind of play around with yourself just to see We'll talk a little bit more in the next tutorial about what um, the head pointer means and um, get resets. I would say use sparingly. They essentially just put your um, repository or your workspace back to a certain stage. So here, if you have a file that you want to reset, you do the get reset file name. It'll reset it to whatever that staging was. And here, if you want to go back to a certain commit, you can do the git reset commit command, and it will get you back to a certain commit that you were at. Um, I would say play around with those. Be careful. If you're really struggling, there are some other things you can do, such as git rebase, which will change your local repo or your workspace to match your local repo and vice versa. Um, but play around with that. Good luck, and I hope you stay tuned for the next tutorial where we talk about branching and more about what version control is. Thanks for watching.